welcome everyone to the session on typed functional programming uh, with Saurabh Nanda. Uh, without any further ado, over to you, Saurabh. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a quick shout out. Uh, how many of the participants have heard of this language called Dal? So just a quick thing. This is actually the Hindi Dal pulses. It's just that some like a, a foreigner has given this name. So it's D-H-A-L-L. That day I was uh, going through a talk and someone was pronouncing it as D-Hall. So it's not D-Hall. It's not Dhal. It's not Dhal. It's Dal. Dal Roti. Dal. Right. So that's, that's what it is. I don't know why it's named that, but whatever. So, uh, yeah. So essentially the premise that I'm going to walk everyone through is Dal is probably a good stepping stone towards like, uh, towards learning type functional programming and, um, mostly the kind of programming that is promoted by, uh, Haskell, the kind of ergonomics, the kind of type system, the kind of purity, uh, that Haskell has, there's a big overlap between Dal and uh, what Haskell does. And Haskell, I think, is pretty much the flag bearer of type functional programming. It's the purest form. It's the most unforgiving form. It has got no escape hatches. So uh, so that's the premise that I'll be walking everyone through, that DAL is probably a good gateway drug uh, towards type functional programming. Right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is like something which I've learned firsthand while learning Haskell uh, myself. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be using FP and Haskell uh, uh, pretty interchangeably uh, because that's what I'm talking about, typed functional programming as embodied by Haskell. So uh, doing FP the right way is hard, right? Uh, I've learned this firsthand um, while learning Haskell myself. And I have witnessed this secondhand while mentoring and training other members in various teams to pick up FP, right? So in fact, I have a talk about this uh, based on all of these learnings, a much longer talk, why Haskell particularly is so hard and how to deal with it. So there's the link to the talk. If anyone's interested, they can go and revisit that. Uh, the problem with learning FP the right way is that apart from Haskell and probably say a, a pure script, uh, most FP languages have too many escape hatches, right? Yesterday, uh, we had a talk, great talk from, uh, by Luca from, uh, who was there. They took a similar decision. They decided not to use TypeScript, but instead go with Elm because TypeScript had too many escape hatches and was trying to retrofit a functional programming paradigm on top of JavaScript, right? So that's, that's the problem. It is too many uh, escape hatches. And what, what ends up happening is if all your FP features are essentially opt-in, you like uh, people who've done imperative or OOP programming for the last five years, six years, seven years, they tend to use their muscle memory and that muscle memory is tuned towards OOP and imperative program. So they end up adopting a new syntax, but they're essentially still doing OOP or imperative, whatever you want to call it. They're not doing FP. So like a first hand example, very recent, uh, that I've gone through is Kotlin. I, uh, tried, um, sort of, uh, migrating a team uh, from Java to Kotlin. It was an Android team. So all of them learned the Kotlin syntax, but till date, you know, I have to keep reminding them to not use mutable variables, to not sort of uh, 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 get down to writing for loops, to use filters, to use maps, uh, you know, keep, like you're using Kotlin. Uh, the whole point of Kotlin is that it has a, large number of FP uh, features, but again, coming from six years of Java development and Kotlin having so many escape hatches, they're still writing Java code, but in Kotlin syntax, right? So uh, this is the, this is the, uh, the hypothesis that is slowly becoming stronger in my head. And it has, it has been sort of echoed by other panelists, other speakers in this conference itself, right? So the idea is that no escape hatches is a good thing when learning it, right? But the flip side of that is that it makes the learning process that much harder, right? You have to unlearn, you have to build new muscle memory, you have to change the way you're, you're thinking and, and how hard that process can be is absolutely embodied by Haskell, right? You, you will, uh, uh, you have so many firsthand experiences where people have given up learning Haskell after spending a good two or three months, right? So while 
having escape hatches makes you feel good makes you feel like you're making progress but there's a very high chance that you're no longer doing fp but now if you pick a language which has zero escape hatches the like the learning curve becomes just so steep that it becomes a frustrating experience so what's the middle ground there is some middle ground that i have found there are haskell inspired languages and they seem to be a good first step a good gateway drug towards learning full fledged type functional programming right so they these kind of languages they have a gentler learning curve there there is a lot of concept overlap between haskell and these languages uh there is a, a similar lack of escape hatches but but they have better tooling they have better compiler errors so the developer experience is uh is better right so and most of the times these are special purpose languages and uh, they pick they they, uh, they say that we are right, this language is to solve this problem and they solve the developer experience for that problem and they avoid the complex parts of the general purpose haskell and there are a lot of complex parts in in general purpose haskell right one example is elm again two talks that i personally uh, attended in this uh, in this conference which were about elm and they sort of echoed this uh, understanding of elm being a gentler a more approachable uh, stepping stone towards full fledged type functional programming right so elm is a production grade language for building front end apps uh, no red ink is using it i learned rakuten is also using it and it is heavily inspired by haskell a lot of uh, overlap in concepts and the compiler itself is written in haskell similarly now the other language that i have discovered is dal right now dal is a specialized language someone is on the chat dal is an embedded dsl for config management right yes absolutely right it's a special language it's a specialized language for managing large and complex configurations it's heavily inspired by haskell and nix so nix is like a whole new ball game for package management and managing os dependencies which is highly functional and nix is also very purest in nature so it's uh it's it's taking ideas from haskell and nix because it's it's sort of at the intersection of uh, uh it's picking functional programming ideas from haskell and it's picking um you know uh, package management configuration management ideas from nix again the compiler is written completely in haskell right so irrespective of the learning uh, uh sort of le like the learnability of dal the fact that it has a it has a uh gentler learning curve why is dal worth learning otherwise right so dal is not a toy language it's uh, uh it's not uh, it, it's not a um, it's not a learning language right it's not uh, it's not like how most people use scheme like right? they they pick up scheme when they are when they are going through the sicp book but they generally don't tend to use scheme in in uh, in production in their day to day work but dal is not like that and why is it worth learning right what what problems does it solve so when i first discovered dal this was the question in my head as well like okay complex it's like how complex can configuration files be why would we need a special language or tool for that right and then i came across kubernetes right so dal itself seemed overkill to me till a few years ago in fact that underline is uh, is a link to an issue on the dal github tracker where i'm asking this question itself that what is the rationale for dal right and then i immediately understood it while when i started writing kubernetes configuration files right so don't get me wrong dal is not only for kubernetes right dal is a general configuration language it's not specific to kubernetes but the thing is that just dealing with kubernetes which is which is becoming so common place nowadays dealing with the like the configuration explosion of kubernetes makes you immediately realize the power and use case of dal right so again it is not only for kubernetes big caps bold whatever right you should not walk away from this talk saying oh i will use dal only when i'm using kubernetes no but there is that's the that's the thing that makes you immediately realize the power of dal but if you're in a mid size to large size company where you moved all your infra to cloud you are uh, doing infrastructure as code even without kubernetes you are probably dealing with a configuration explosion right you don't realize it uh, but there is better tooling there is better developer experience available for manage for managing these config files which are critical for our deployments these days 
right? So what are these problems with these config files, right? Before, so the, the second half of the talk is about Dahl versus Haskell, like we go through a comparative code between the two and see how they are similar, what concepts overlap between them. But before that, I just want to build the case as to why Dahl is, the problem that Dahl is solving is a genuine problem and you should probably have it in your tool belt, uh, in your tool chain, right? So uh, the first problem is you have uh, you you have different config files which don't agree with each other. For example, there is application A and application B. Application A is writing to a, a topic or a queue. Application B is reading or consuming items from that topic or queue. Both of them have configuration files and both of them should be pubbing subbing from the same topic or queue. So two different config files, if they don't have the exact same topic name in them, uh, your uh, application won't work well in production. Another example, uh, your application, your container, your load balancer, all of them should be using the same port. So your application should be uh, opening a socket on that port. Your container should be exposing that port. Your load balancer or ingress should be using the same port as the uh, as the backend uh, sort of service, right? So, okay, I think the talk. I just I have this chat open in front of me. Uh, I think the talk should have started here with the problem. Cool, we just whatever. Five minutes into ten minutes into the talk, uh, but anyways, so that's that's one problem. Uh, the second problem is uh, repetition within the same config file, right? So again, taking an uh, uh, example from Kubernetes, there's a lot of repetition across standards. You need to make sure that you have the uh, name, namespace, key, selector, label, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is the same across multiple places in the same config file. If you don't have it, most probably your kubectl apply command will work. Happily, it will accept it, but then you will end up with a service downtime. Then you will spend hours debugging where you forgot to copy paste the exact same name, namespace, key, selector, label, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So repetition within the same config file. Then uh, comes duplication between config files for different environments. So at a lot of places, we've seen that there is like a 100, 200 line config file uh, for dev, 100, 200 line config file for staging, 100, 200 config line for uh, 100 200 line config file for production right now there's more than 70 percent duplication between these files these are physically separate files even if the values are different which most probably they are then the keys need to be exactly the same and what happens if you add a key in the dev config but forget to add in production right same you know your app will uh refuse to start in production then you'll be dealing with a downtime after deploy right? Malformed config files. A lot of times, even though tooling is available, we end up writing YAML and JSON, JSON config files with hand. YAML has indentation errors, JSON trailing comma, unterminated um, codes, etc., etc. right? Uh, typos in key names. Again, all of this can be caught by linters, but really how many of us are really setting them, them up as a standard practice? We've seen so many teams uh, that we are helping, consulting with, even in our own projects that I am guilty of not setting these up myself, right? So then another problem, structurally incorrect config files. It is syntactically correct, but there's an incorrect schema, right? So for example, key added at incorrect level of nesting, you know, instead of adding a list with a single element, you've added a, a, a scalar value, right? Again, schema validation is possible, JSON schema is there, but how many times do we routinely write schemas for every single config file? Uh, that we are using, right? Uh, this is a slightly subtle uh, take on the on the same problem. Completely untested config files for higher environments. So what happens is when you have physically separate config files for each environment, uh, when you're uh, when you're signing off on a, on a code plus config artifact in a lower environment, say in a staging or QA environment, you are expecting that when this goes, when this is promoted to production you will have very few surprises. But that doesn't really hold true when your uh, config files are physically separate between the lower environments and higher environments. Because suddenly when you promote, you are introducing a completely new config file, which has been completely untested in the lower environments, right? But if your config files are being generated from the same source of, source of truth, then apart from the values being different, you are absolutely sure that the keys are going to be the same. The schema is going to be the same. The white space is going to be the same. Everything is going to be the same. So the percentage of file of your config file that has been tested in the lower environment is far higher than introducing a completely new untested file 
suddenly before going to production right so that's the kind of problems now yeah okay i'll i'll just take a pause here because on the next section of the talk is all mostly about code 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 and fp concepts uh okay uh any questions hang on uh, no questions till now i'll just take uh, Uh, sort of, we have one question in the Q&A box. I am. Um, Nareesh is asking. Is Nareesh's question? Yeah, yeah. In, in yesterday's team keynote, his advice was not to use static type language for config management. Instead, just use a temp single template. What is your take on his point of view? I think this is uh, using a sim simple template is would would sort of lead you to this can very easily lead you to this malformed config files problem, or sometimes. There are things that you need to do in templates that is not possible with simple text templating. Like you want to structurally repeat a JSON uh, object, right? Now, what is better, treating it as a text template or treating it as a JSON object which can be repeated and transformed using a programming language? Wouldn't Helm be a better solution to avoid such problems with uh, KATS files? Uh, probably, probably not. I'm not very experienced with Helm to know that. But again, going back to that, this is not only for Kubernetes, right? So for example, I'll take your word for it, uh, Jyotish. Say Helm is the right approach. What about uh, Helm is the right approach for Kubernetes? Given, I don't know that, probably it is. Uh, what about Nginx config files? What about HA proxy config files? Those are, the, those are also kinds of things that Dal can handle for you right helm is not a solution for those right please correct me if i'm wrong uh, cool shall we uh, move ahead okay i'll i'll just move ahead from you now so yeah so uh, let's see what we are talking of when we say dal is similar to haskell now this assumes that you at least come across the Haskell syntax, uh, at least peripherally. This is not, this talk is not a DAL tutorial as such, right? So for example, uh, this the next three slides will take you through a DAL piece of code, a DAL code snippet, and a Haskell code snippet on the DAL on the left, Haskell on the right, which uh, where we are generating the config file for two applications, where they need to be writing to the same pub sub topic, and they need to be writing to the same logging destination, right? So uh, we need to make sure that both of them are logging in, logging into the same place so that it's, it makes for easier de debugging. And for the app to work properly, both of them should be writing to the same queue topic or same pub sub topic, whatever you want to call it, right? So left side is Dal, right side is uh, Haskell, right? So uh, let's go at the very first thing. The first snippet, which I've highlighted in yellow, uh, in a yellow box over there, is a union or some type for logging uh, for the logging configuration, right? So the logging configuration can either be a log file or it can be syslog, right? You can compare the two snippets side to side, right? So uh, the concept of union or some types is common in both of them. The syntax might be different, but conceptually they are the, they are the same, right? Next thing, uh, here is a record type, a structured record type or a schema, whatever you want to call it for configuration that is common across the application. So just what I said uh, a minute ago, that your logging configuration across the two applications should be same and your topic should be same. Again, you can compare these two code snippets side by side and uh, see how uh, like it's, it's almost like a direct transliteration happening over, over here, right? Uh, then uh, here is the, so the, this thing is the schema and this thing is the value, right? So this is for my development configuration. So in my development, I want the, the logging to happen in a log file called log slash dev dot log. And I want the topic that is used in the queue to be dev dot. Again, just minor changes in syntax, but otherwise it is almost transliterated, right? Now let's see what's like, if you were doing this in Haskell instead, what are the kind of complexities that you would have to deal with, right? So very first thing as a beginner, you will have to deal with this string type nonsense. So Haskell has some 
three or four types of string types. And when you write a string, it can either be interpreted as a string or a text or a byte string or a lazy byte string or a lazy text. And you need to uh, use this uh, language extension to be able to do things uh, sanely and easily, right? So as a, as a newbie, as a person just stepping into functional programming, this is just pure noise. You shouldn't be having to deal with this, right? Then uh, next thing, even till date, having two di different record types in Haskell to have the same name, right, is, is causes problems. So you have to learn how to prefix. So if you notice on the left hand side, the, the field names are just called logging and topic. And on the right hand side, they're called CFG logging and CFG topic. There's a CFG prefix over there. Now this is the artifact of, of some uh, Haskell history and baggage that two records cannot share the same field name. They can, but Right. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, like, even in something. Hi, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Your voice broke there. Uh, no, just. Uh, where I'm, I'm not sure. Just the left I'm uh, not sure if it was just for me. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, please go on. All right. I'll just go on. Right now, let's move on to the next thing. Now, so you, so over here, you've defined the data type and you've defined the value for it. Right. This is all statically type checked code that you're writing now. Then you're writing a function which says that, which takes that native dal data type and converts it into a properties file. So that dot properties file, which are typically used in, uh, sound is fine, sound is fine. All right, cool. Uh, so now this is the, so the previous slide was just defining the data types and the values for the data types. And this slide is defining a function. It takes, a value of type common CFT, the common configuration, and it generates a properties file, right? So this is a function for converting a common config to a string, which represents a properties uh, properties file, right? Uh, there's, there's a slight difference in, in how the functions are defined. The syntax now is slightly diverging, and I'll cover this in the uh, in in uh, uh, slightly later in the presentation. Uh, now this is converting the uh, logging CFG, uh, some type to a property snippet. Also notice that you are having to deal with nested let expressions, right? Something very common in functional programming and also dealing with some types, right? So I will get a some type and I need to consume it. And for every single branch of the some type, I need to return a text value. Right. So that's, that's a, that's a tiny little functional paradigm, functional programming paradigm, which you are getting exposed to while dealing with that. Right. Uh, then finally you're tying it all together in a, uh, to get a final value. Right. Also again, a big let dot let in expression, right. So the whole thing that you have an expression and then you have its supporting definitions in a let binding, right. That whole concept of, uh, doing this in functional programming doesn't come naturally to everyone. Right? Now, again, what are the problems in Haskell that you will have to deal with? Multi-line string literals are not supported. You need to use, so over here, I've not used multi-line string literals. I've just used string concatenation and slash and slash and manually. But there is a way to support multi-line string literals in Haskell, but it requires you to use a, a, a language extension and a special purpose library for that. On the other hand, on DAL, because it is it is for configuration files. They know that they need to support uh, multi-line strings. It is uh, supported out of the box, right? Then finally, uh, another uh, code snippet. This time, instead of outputting a string, like a flat text file, now you are outputting a structured JSON, right? So this is for the, so one application expects a properties file. The other application expects a JSON file as its content, right? So again, function for uh, converting common CFG to a JSON. So on, on the Haskell side, you're converting it to a JSON object. And on the DAL side, you're converting it to a native record. There's a reason for this. Uh, now, yeah, converting the logging uh, some type to native record on the DAL side, because DAL has a built-in way to convert a record to a JSON via this DAL to JSON utility. And converting uh, this to, uh, on the Haskell side, you're converting it to a JSON but by doing a whole lot of AST maths, AST is abstract syntax tree. So we are using the ASON library 
which helps you serialize and deserialize JSON. And we are being forced to manually sort of construct the JSON uh, AST. Right? This is not how you would typically do it in production code. In production code, you would end up using something like generics and auto deriving of the JSON instance type class instances. But to be able to reach that level, you have to understand generics, you have to understand type classes, you have to understand auto derivation. So a whole lot of, again, steep learning curve to do something as simple as convert an object to JSON. So, and then you tying it all together to get a final value, right? Uh, third, third and final uh, part of the presentation. I'll pause here. Any questions? So Kim, uh, uh, to answer your question, so Kim, uh, I guess everyone can read the chat. Kim's question is that why aren't we focusing more on the problem of how Dahl solves the configuration problem? But that's not the topic of this talk. Your question is valid. It's not an invalid question that why is writing, why are writing config files in Dahl better than uh, writing, you know, Helm or Kubernetes config files directly? That's a valid question. Uh, it's a question you should ask before adopting Dahl in your tool chain. But the topic of this talk is how Dahl is a stepping stone towards functional programming, right? So the, the like that's the primary focus of this of this talk. So now we will cover the kind of concepts that you will be forced to learn correctly while solving the configuration management problem using that. Right. So that's the that's the angle that this talk is taking. So uh, what will Dal force you to uh, learn correctly? Right. The basic premise of this talk: stepping stone towards type functional programming, not having escape hatches, but still giving you a gentle learning curve to be able to use certain fundamental concepts of functional programming, right? So immutability, right? Dahl has immutability, and this is like the very first stumbling block of every imperative programmer. Sometimes when, you, when you've when you not written code with immutable variables, immutable bindings, it sometimes is incomprehensible for someone, like how can you solve problems in a programming language where you're not allowed to change the value of a variable, right? So that whole concept of working with immutable bindings and variables, uh, that's what the DAL will force you to bring this into your muscle memory, right? Explicit nulls. Again, another beginner stumbling block. We are used, everyone is just used to putting null checks in the middle of their, the, the core of their code, but uh, having to explicitly define that this can be a nullable value using the option type, using sum and none. Uh, then you sort of end up going through that thought process of saying, hey, do I really need this to be an optional type throughout my code? Or can I check this at the boundary of my program? And at the boundary of the program, either I accept or reject the input, and then I don't need to deal with the null. So that kind of thinking of pushing these expectations on data to the boundary uh, and so starts developing once you have to deal with explicit nulls. Right. Currying and lambdas. This is going back to uh, this. Uh, I'll said I'll, I'll cover this later on in, in the presentation. I'll see if I can go back. Right. So in Haskell, all functions are curried by default, but the uh, the type signature doesn't make it obvious to you. Right. But in in uh, uh, co contrast that with Haskell, uh, contrast that contrast that with Dal. Uh, there, the uh, way of defining functions, the syntax of defining functions might seem noisy at first, but to a newcomer, it makes it immediately obvious what's happening, that every function is a curried single value function. And on top of that, it's a lambda until unless I give it a name, right? So what's going on underneath the hood and what all you can do with curried functions becomes uh, very obvious in Dal, whereas it's hidden in Haskell, right? So you sort of tend to start understanding and using this concept more effectively in Dal. Forced to use higher order functions. Dal A doesn't have for loops. It doesn't even have general recursion. So Dal purposely doesn't have general recursion. One thing which I have not mentioned over here is that Dal claims and uh, it claims it very proudly that they are not Turing complete, right? Because the, the, the designers of the language feel that a configuration language should not be Turing complete, right? 
so it doesn't have general uh, general recursion and apart from using higher order functions that come with the library map filter fold merge there is no other way there is no escape hatch you cannot drop down to loops you cannot drop down to writing recursions by hand you have to use those or you have to express all data transformations using these higher order functions right functional purity no side effects dal a it anyways has no uh, way to do iu except at the very boundaries and again no function can have any side effects apart from returning a value right homogeneous list and sum and unit types i sort of uh, uh, take these two things together is that what i've seen in practice is that because of the constraint of homogeneous list right people end up exploring sum and unit types right specifically people coming from uh, dynamically typed languages where <clears throat> lists like a list can have integers and strings and booleans and some record it doesn't matter right but in languages like haskell and also other statically typed languages uh, your lists need to be homogeneous but then you will come across a situation where you need to have a heterogeneous list that's when you start exploring sum and unit types right so that is one of the reasons why devs are forced to start defining their own sum and unit types and then that opens up those gates of using uh, more a uh, richer data type uh, richer data types to solve the uh, problems right this one this is something which is subtle takes time to dawn upon you that everything in dal everything in haskell is an expression it's expressions all the way down right uh everything giant if conditions giant switch case conditions function inside function let in whatever order everything is an expression and the expression needs to evaluate to a single type right uh this this uh this realization itself that in the end i am writing a big expression which is being evaluated it it comes faster in dal because because of the nature of the problem you are taking something you are doing a data transformation and you are outputting it so you can see the expression being like smaller parts of the expression uh being chained and uh composed to form a larger expression right uh then forced usage of the type system right this is something of specifically in type functional programming how to use the rich type system that something like haskell has something like even scala has is probably the hardest problem uh, right there are many talks in functional conf itself about how to build uh, how to look at your domain and model that in types you know etc etc uh dal sort of forces this upon you how for example because dal is in the configuration management space uh, it is very easy to start doing things using strings like which is called stringly type programming so for example dal does not even have a string equality operator no regex nothing you cannot do stringly type programming in dal it just prevents you from falling back to that you have to start learning and using the type system some types record types list whatever 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 to ex express your solution right so there's some amount of forced usage of the type system which starts building your muscle memory around that right and the whole point of all of this is that while it forces you to do all of these things it still makes the journey slightly easier a it's modern it wasn't built so many years ago like haskell was it has very little baggage it is special purpose and it has evolved with good tooling it is built ground up from good tooling so it has decent id support it has a dal a uh, language server protocol implementation which works very well with vs code it has a super fast compiler super fast run time it has it has no run time errors it has good compiler errors uh and then even when it is so there is this thing inbuilt into dal where uh it can give you semantic diffing right so if your uh record has three fields and your schema or your type has four fields it will do a semantic diff very nicely and it will show you that this is the exact field that you're missing across xml across json across native dal records mm -hmm. uh so that's that's actually very useful when it comes to uh, good compiler errors uh and like there's a whole lot more the way it uh, uses checksums to ensure that your expression has a change the way it uses uh, the way it has a very interesting uh, import and package management uh, sort of uh, uh, solution built into it so all of that uh, are like the good parts of dal which make this journey 
much more easier right so uh, yeah so dal solves a real problem which is configuration management and obviously there are two people who are asking the same question that uh, you know sure it can it can solve this problem but so can helm right uh, i'll leave that to you give both a try see whether helm makes more sense or whether dal makes more sense and then why not json net why not qnet so just because another tool exists to solve a problem doesn't uh, sort of preclude another tool from solving it in a different way right so uh, and the good part is that dal opens up your mind towards type functional programming so it is a stepping stone towards perhaps becoming a better scala programmer perhaps becoming a better kotlin programmer perhaps becoming a better elm programmer perhaps becoming a better haskell programmer right so yeah that's the end of my talk oh we have one question in the q and a have you used this in production yes uh, can't name uh, the company because uh, we are actively consulting with them but very large a uh, company with i don't know about 4000 engineers and again explosion of configuration so most of the problems that i mentioned uh, in my slides were actual observations in the way that this company was managing configuration files right so yes i have used it in production and others are also using this in production you can go to the dal home page and there's a section over there dal in production Which actually list companies which are using this in production. Ah, uh, we have one Find more. Any resistance from ops people uh, to this, right? So actually, that's a uh, that's a very good question. And uh, Dal is like not the only place where we are trying hard to answer this, right? So as happens with every tool, there's a tool which solves a problem. uh you can see that it solves the problem in the small so like i don't know how many people are aware of this in the small and in the large sort of debate so dal solves this it really does solve this problem very well in the small but when you're scaling it across multiple teams where there are handoffs involved between the dev team and the ops team uh when you have to think of how does the config file how does the release pipeline how does the build pipeline world work with the branching strategy of the code how does it work with the testing strategy of the qa qa team so apart from the core tool what i'm saying is apart from the core tool there's a whole lot of process angles around it right so uh, those process angles are different for different companies right so for example uh, if in your uh, if in your organization the ops people are used to managing variables by managing like these kind of configuration variables via something like azure devops release pipelines so azure devops release pipelines has a ui where you can manage these configuration variables that has its own set of pros and cons now if they are used to that and you suddenly want them to move to dal there can be a pushback right so does this work for the processes that your organization is using today uh what would it take to change those processes to sort of uh, uh be now built around dal that's a question that every organization will have to answer for themselves that's not something that the tool can answer and uh, dal doesn't even attempt to answer those kind of process level questions but yes it's a very valid question that uh, when it comes to fitting this tool inside a larger process there are challenges cool we'll wrap this up all right that was a great uh, talk sir very informative